Global Space Alert Correlation is one of the two scales through which you can look at Space Alert Correlation. It's one that places its emphasis on the overall trend. So in this clip, we're going to explore a little bit more how we can define it, what types of global space law correlation are, and more importantly, what practical tools can we use to measure it and explore global space law correlation in our data sets. Let's jump on the slides. Remember, global space law correlation is about clustering, is about whether the overall trend, this is a key idea in this concept, the overall trend is of any follows any pattern in particular, any pattern of clustering, whether on average you can say that a map is cl has clustered or not, whether on average observations that are more similar statistically speaking, in other words that values that are similar, tend to be located in either similar places or dissimilar places in a systematic way throughout the uh, map. And we can have two flavors, as we've seen in previous clips. One is positive, and this is cases where similar values overall tend to be clustered in similar locations. And this gives rise to what we would call high, high or low, low. So we can have cases where um, similar values, similarly high values, tend to be clustered in the same location and then similarly low values tend to be also located in similar places among themselves or negative space a lot of correlation so be very careful when you look at positive and negative space a lot of correlation is not that positive values imply positive space a lot of correlation you can have cluster of negative values and that would be positive space a lot of correlation the key here is that positive space a lot of correlation relates to whether similar values are located in similar locations. And negative, which is a bit more counterintuitive, is all about whether similar values systematically or on average tend to be more further apart than you would expect them by random chance. Now, these are all ideas that hopefully will help you land the concept of global space a lot of correlation. Now let's see how we can implement and how we can operationalize this notion into a tool, a statistical tool or a statistic that we can use to explore whether a map that we are given, whether a data set that we want to analyze has this, is displaying some form of uh, global space a lot of correlation. And in this context, we're going to focus on something called the Moran plot, which is a graphical device. So we're going to start this translation between the conceptual notion of global space alert correlation and a statistical translation through visualization. Remember, we've said before in this course how visualization is a good tool to get us thinking about what are the processes. So in this context, we're using it to translate an abstract statist an, an abstract term or an abstract concept into a statistical, very tangible measure. So the Moran plot is a graphical device that displays the values of a given variable in the horizontal axis against the values of the spatial lag of that variable in the vertical axis. Remember, we also saw the meaning of the spatial lag in a previous clip. And by doing these, well, the, this both usually you would expect both, although it's not necessary, that both the variable and the, the space alike are standardized, but that is not, not crucial. And what is more important is that the Moran plot provides a, a ready and quick to assess way to check the overall association between the values at a given location and the values in the surroundings of each location. Remember, the spatial lag help us, helps us measure what are the values of a variable, not in a location, but in its surrounding neighborhood. What this, what the Moran plot is doing, is, which is a scatter plot, is putting in relation the values of that variable 
in a particular location with the values in the neighborhood of that location and is doing that for the entire data set, for the entire same sample of data that we have. Let's see an example to see if we can land a bit more practically speaking this idea. Let's imagine we start with a map like this one, which is uh, the city of Liverpool in the UK. And it's a choropleth that is dis displaying the distribution of deprivation. So higher deprivation is encoded into darker shades of green and lower deprivation is encoded into lighter shades of yellow. Now, would you say that deprivation is cluster here or not? Do you, would you say that we can observe clustering, that overall similar values tend to be located in similar locations? Well, if that was true, one would expect to find dark color close or nearby other dark green color, sorry, and light yellow nearby other light yellow. And in fact, we can see that that's the case here. Here we have, we can then say that we have a, we can intuitively say we have a case of positive, remember similar values nearby uh, each other, positive space a lot of correlation. Global, because we're talking about the overall map, this is an assessment that we make of the map as an overall trend. Now let's look at what would the Moran plot would look like for this map. And this is what we would get. Here on the horizontal axis, we have the IMD score, the index of multiple deprivation, so the measure that we're using to look at deprivation. And on the vertical axis, we have the spatial lag of that. So for a given polygon, for example, the average deprivation that is associated not with the polygon, but with the surrounding neighbors. And as I mentioned before, in this case, both the score and it, the spatial lag, it's standardized, which means that zero is associated with the average value and the units one, two, and three are expressed in standard deviations. So a value that is here over two for IMD would be two standard deviations above the average of the sample that we have. And what we can see is a pretty clear pattern of positive autocorrelation. So Moran plot is a way of measuring spatial autocorrelation using non-spatial autocorrelation, if you realize, because there's nothing spatial here other than on the vertical axis we have the um, spatial lag. And this is the way in which we bring geographical context to the statistical tool. So once we get a visual representation, remember we start with a geographical pattern and we want to characterize these statistically. Our first step is Moran plot, which is a graphic device, graphic non-spatial device, except that it has the spatial lag baked into it. Then the next step is trying to characterize this graphical device with a number. And again, here, this is a, a highlight of global space, a lot of correlation, that it's, it's a way of summarizing information. We start with an entire map, a lot of colors and a lot of polygons. We convert those into a graphic display that doesn't have space except for the spatial lag. And then we end up into a summary that we will call in this case, we're going to use Moran's I, which is a statistic that is a formal test for global spatial order correlation. And what it tries to do is statistically identify the presence of clustering in a variable. So it's a number that is going to tell us whether overall a map follows a spatial pattern or not. The link with the Moran plot comes here, is that even though it has an equation that I'm going to skip for the sake of simplicity here and just to focus on the intuition so you, you retain the intuition, the key here is that there is a connection between Moran's I, the statistic, which is a number, and Moran plot, and a Moran plot, which is a graphic device. 
and that is that the statistic Moran's eye is the slope or the inclination of this line, which is the best line of fit for the scatter plot of the uh, Moran plot. In addition to calculating Moran's I, which is the statistic that gives us a sense of the degree to which there is clustering in our map, we are also going to be able to perform something called inference. If you're familiar with traditional statistics, inference is a family of techniques that allows us to say whether a pattern is statistically uh, significant or whether, in other words, whether we can say that we have enough statistical evidence that the test that we're trying to perform is different from the null hypothesis, if you're familiar with statistical parlance. In the context of Moran's eye, what we're really trying to get at with inference is to find out whether the pattern that we're observing in our uh, data, in this case, let's go back to the illustration, whether this pattern is compatible with a world with which the values have been locating, located in a random way, or in other words, with a complete spatial randomness. If the pattern that we observe is compatible with that, we will say that there, there is not enough evidence for statist significant statistical autocorrelation or st statistically significant spatial autocorrelation. Now, if we can say that the pattern that we find is not compatible or there's not evidence that is compatible with a, spatial, with a spatially random world, we will say that we have good evidence to suggest that there is a systematic pattern of spatial autocorrelation or a statistically significant pattern of st spatial autocorrelation. And how do we do that? How do we pull the trick of the inference well, what we do, or really we don't do it, the computer will do it for us, but it's important to know the intuition of what's happening behind the scenes. What the computer does is it keeps the values of our variable constant. It saves the same, it maintains the same values that we have in the real world, but assigns in a subsequent series of several simulations, random locations to each value. So. While this is what we observe in reality, the inference engine is going to shuffle these values all over the place in a random way. And for every shuffle that it performs, it calculates Moran's i and it saves the value. And after several simulations like this, let's say a thousand or two thousand, we can build the distribution of Moran's i for our values on a situation where we know there is no spatial autocorrelation because we've built in randomness. The opposite of spatial autocorrelation is randomness, okay? So once we have that spatial distribution, that distribution of values for Moran's eye with our geography and our variable um, capturing spatial randomness, we compare the one we observe with that one with the distribution of random values, and we try to see to what extent we have evidence for non-random um, for non-random patterns. And this is something that you can explore more in the handsome part of the blog, and will probably give you a better intuition once you play with code to see what what happens.